So how come I don't run a dual battery system on any of my Jeeps? And what made me pull the bead locks off and go with a standard alloy wheel? And if I had to choose what would be my favorite three upgrades that I've done to my Jeep Gladiator? Well, those questions and more are gonna be answered today on this episode of Trail Recon Garage Coffee. Stay tuned. Welcome to Trail Recon Garage Coffee Edition. I'm Brad, and this is where we grab a cup of coffee, turn on the camera, let it roll, not gonna edit any of this, hang out in the garage, and I'm gonna answer your questions. And we'll just spend a little bit of time just talking about off-roading and overlanding. It's a lot of fun. This is now the third episode, and I'm really having a good time with this. And we did something new for this one. What do you think? That's pretty cool, right? Now you got something to look at besides my pretty face and my gray hair. My gray hair that's getting way, way too long. I cannot wait until the barber shops open up. I really need a haircut. So before I dive in to your questions, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna start uh, highlighting a rig of the week. And this will just be a vehicle that I've come across on the you know, websites or internet or wherever that I thought was interesting. And the one that I found interesting this week was this concept drawing right here from Dr. Death Wobble on Instagram. If you aren't following him, go check it out. But I am super excited to see this build come to fruition. I love classic vehicles. I definitely plan on doing a classic build here on Trail Recon in the near future. The near future. Uh, and so I cannot wait to see him put this together. They've done a lot of great builds over there. So go follow them along. Uh, I really enjoy their stuff and I cannot wait to, uh, to see that come alive. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and dive right into your questions. And this week, there were a ton of good questions that you guys submitted. So I think we're having a great conversation on some stuff. And if you liked a question of yours answered here on Trail Recon, just put it down in the comments below and it'll be considered for the next episode. All right, here we go. Uh, Alberta Back Road. Out of all the rig walkarounds you've done, I've done quite a few, excluding your own, which one is your favorite? Uh, I, think, I think it's fair to say excluding mine and excluding Marco's because Marco's would probably be my favorite one that we've ever done. Uh, but this is actually pretty easy. I mean, I've, I've, I've looked at some really cool rigs over the last, what, five years that we've been doing this. My favorite one that I've done was that AEV Outpost. That thing, oh my gosh, I love the way that vehicle was put together. I mean, to be able to take that camper shell and put it on the back of a Wrangler like that and then just go hit the trails and camp and live inside that, oh my gosh. I would love to take that thing and put it on the back of my Gladiator. I think that would be ideal, but that's an easy one. I love that vehicle. All right, uh, let's see who's next here. Doc Wrangler, Rod Doc. What have been the options of staying in touch with your wife when you're off the grid? That's a great question. So being in the military for 26 years, she was, my wife's used to me being gone and away and not having communications a lot. You know, sometimes there's no email when I was deployed. Sometimes we would go weeks and weeks and weeks without talking, which was tough. But you know, now there's really no need for that. There's plenty of ways to communicate even when I'm off the grid. And so I used to use the Spot X for texting my wife. Um, but that was really kind of clunky. I almost should do a review of that, or at least a comparison to what I'm using now, which is the Garmin InReach, which I love the Garmin InReach because it pairs up with my phone, and then I can just text her back and forth. She can text me, get good notifications. It's a really good system. Uh, the Spot X was nice. I was excited when that thing came out, but it just, I don't know, the, the platform wasn't great. I, I don't have a satellite phone. I've thought about getting one, but you know what? Being able to text her, it, it works out well, and, and we're both happy with it. And, and usually, usually we don't have to communicate when I'm off the grid. We do have kind of a routine, though. Usually before I go to bed, I make sure I at least send her a text just to let her know, hey, I'm okay, all is good. Okay, uh, Ken Patrick. Would you be camping out during this lockdown we're having? I really want to go somewhere dispersed but I just don't know. And so the answer to that is no, I'm not. Um, the governor here in California has put a, you know, a stay at home order in place and all the recreational areas are closed down. Even the BLM recreational areas are closed. I think the, tra the BLM trails and dispersed camping are still open, but I'm just trying to do the responsible thing. And so 
we're staying at home, we're waiting this out. As soon as the gates open, we're gonna you know, load up and, and we're gonna go have a great adventure. So I'm not doing anything now, but you know, that's here in California. Depends where you're at, you know, everybody's law, local laws are different, so just make sure you look into that and make a decision for yourself. For me, I'm staying home. Uh, did Josh Rodriguez, any plans for new axles on the JT? That's a great question. Uh, and we'll see if I'm gonna do that I don't know. I don't think there's no, we'll see. I'm definitely probably going to do, I'm definitely probably, I did that again. I'm going to upgrade the axles on the Gladiator. It's just a matter of when. Uh, I waited way too long to upgrade my front axle on my Wrangler and had to do a bunch of repairs up to that point. I don't think I want to go through the same transition where, you know, I'm putting C gussets on there, I'm putting chromoly axles on there, doing ball joints. I think it might be wise this time to just, you know, put a little bit of time on a few miles on the Gladiator, and then just go ahead and swap them out, and then it's peace of mind. I don't have to worry about it. So that's probably what I'm gonna do. Kyle Penley, are you fitting a 38 spare under the Gladiator, uh, and how are you liking the new gear? So on the Gladiator, I'm running 38 inch tires right now. Uh, I'm probably gonna go back to a 37. I'm just gonna wear these tires out, but no, there is not a 38 inch spare in the back. You can't get, a I shouldn't say you can't. I haven't been able to fit a 38 inch spare back there because between the rear track bar and the trailer hitch, there's only so much room. And so I deflate a 37 inch tire and it fits up there nicely. Uh, but I think I'm gonna run 37s all around at the end of the day. Um, you know, the 30, 38s are not just bigger, but they're also wider. And so that's a little extra weight. So going back to a 37, get a little bit better gas mileage, the Gladiator will be happier with me. Uh, Timothy Ayun. I probably am not saying that right. I would like to see more options, pros or cons, for tent heaters, electric blankets, other ideas for keeping warm in a tent at, uh, or a camper. And, you know, that's great. Um, I think there's a lot of options out there. I think a diesel heater is one of the best options because a diesel heater is something that's outside of the tent and it just circulates hot air into your tent or your camper. Uh, you don't have to worry about any fumes or anything like that, but it is something you have to carry. You've got to set up. There's all that to worry about. Uh, I have a little Mr. Buddy heater that I use. Uh, it's not recommended to set that up in your tent and just let it run. Usually what I will do is I will warm up the tent before I go to bed. And then uh, in the morning, I will turn it on really for like a couple minutes just to warm up. So when I'm getting out of my sleeping bag and it's cold, um, I'm not having to <laughs> freeze to death. So it does, it does a pretty good job, but it's definitely not something that I turn on and just let run all night long. You can do that with those little diesel heaters. As far as electric blanket goes, I guess that just depends on what your power source is. Uh, I, for me, I would kill my battery if I did that. So I'm not running an electric blanket. Uh, I think it could be an option. Okay, um, John, man, you guys are killing me with the names. I've, I, Sachina, hello. Uh, what upgrade do you wish you never did to the JK and why? Uh, that's, that's a tough one. There's been a few things, and I did a video a while back about things that I put on and took off, but I think the one that stands out to me was that throttle booster. I put that throttle booster on there and it's a sensitivity booster. So uh, when you step on the gas on a JK, normally it takes a little while for it to kick in. Uh, you put the throttle booster on there, it makes it very, very sensitive. And it had some adjustability on there. I just found that I didn't like it. Um, maybe it was because I was just used to driving my JK for so long before, once I finally put that on there. Uh, but once I put it on there, it was just too touchy, even on the medium settings and definitely out on the rocks. And my gas mileage fell because I was stepping on it a little too hard. Uh, so that was probably the one that I just wish I never did. I didn't keep it on there very long. Wayne Larson, what are your thoughts on a dual battery versus a power station like a Goal Zero? So this is a great question and one that I get asked all the time. And so uh, the reason I have not run a dual battery system, and, and first of all, let me preface this why, a dual battery system is a great option for a lot of people. It just hasn't been something that I have needed. Marco runs a dual battery system on his Jeep. It works perfect for him. But what I found is when I'm running a fridge and all my accessories, we're going to places and we're just staying for a night and then we're rolling on and going to the next day. And so I, I can run my fridge overnight on just my red top battery and it's never been a problem. If we're gonna stay somewhere for multiple days like we've done in Baja, then what I'll do is I'll just take the fridge and I'll plug it into a Goal Zero. And I just upgraded to a Goal Zero Lithium after having used the other one for a long time. I like it because it's so much lighter and so much smaller. Uh, but the Goal Zero works for me, especially because we have multiple vehicles. So I don't have to put a dual battery in the JK, put a dual battery in the Gladiator, put a dual 
portable battery in my wife's Jeep. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, I just take the portable battery with me on depending on which vehicle I go with. And having the Patriot Camper is that thing that's got its own uh, battery power source. So now that's a great option. So that's why I don't run a dual battery system. I don't have to worry about that extra weight. I don't have to worry about extra wiring. And they're not cheap. Uh, not to say that the Goal Zeros are, aren't, they're, they're, not, they're not cheap. Uh, and there are some other options out there that are a little less expensive. I just like the Goal Zero. It's been, you know, it's been something I've used. I'm familiar with it. That's my reasoning. So I hope I answered that question. A little bit of a ramble there. Sorry, guys. Uh, all right. Ben Credible Jeep Adventures. What's your favorite Jeep? CJ, TJ, JK, JL, or JTNY? All right. So you only gave me CJ, TJ, JK, JL, or JTNY. And so out of those options, I mean, my JK is my favorite. Otherwise, I wouldn't have it. My JK is absolutely my favorite, and I love my Gladiator. Uh, but I think the CJ8, a Scrambler, man, that's up there. That, was, that would definitely be a close second to my JK. But you've left one out. How about an SJ? I have been looking hard at Wagoneers and Cherokee Chiefs. SJ, yep. I think those are pretty cool. At least those have been heavy on my mind lately. I'm talking about classic Jeeps a lot. We'll see what happens. Uh, when are you with lifting the wife's JL? Great question. I know we've been putting that off and actually we've been putting that off on purpose uh, because I'm going to order a rock slide engineering sidestep for her. I know that we did that video and she said she was fine hopping in and out, but I think she's just going to be much, much happier having that installed, ready to go. So when we do lift it, she's not going to have to hop up and down at all. The only challenge is, is those are not cheap. And so, you know, now's not the right time to spend that much money on something like that. So I'm just holding off buying that. So uh, probably here in the next couple of weeks, once things kind of open back up and the economy's going and people are going back to work, I'll go ahead and buy that and install her lift kit. So a little delay on that. I know people have been looking forward to it. Chris Jensen, if you could have any engine in a Jeep, what would it be? Ah, uh, that would be a Hellcat in a Wagoneer or a uh, Cherokee Chief. That's if money was no object. I don't think that will ever happen, but that would be awesome. Uh, you know, an old 70s Wagoneer with a Hellcat motor? Whew, come on, that would be awesome. Pablisi, uh, do you think the electronics that come with the newer Jeeps, whether it be the electronic disconnects or things like the LED screens on the newer Gladiators and JLs will become a hindrance in, uh, in how long? Yeah, uh, a little bit of a typo there. In how long do you... Um, yeah, yeah, anybody, see, we're not editing this, guys. I told you we're not editing. Basically, he's asking, over a period of time, do you think all the electronics on the newer Jeeps is gonna be a problem? I, I think the answer to that is yes. It's just a matter of when, right? Is it 10 years, is it 15 years, is it 20 years? Eventually, those things are gonna, you know, they're gonna become dated. You're probably gonna have to upgrade some of the computer systems, maybe the screens or whatever. It's nice not having to worry about that on older Jeeps. The JK, you know, it still has a little bit of electronics on there but nothing like the Gladiator and the Jails. You know, if you want to go, if you want to be a purist, get that classic Jeep, then you don't have to worry about that stuff. Everything's mechanical. That's what I loved about my 72 Firebird. I could fix just about anything on my own. I mean, I remember pulling the dash apart and fixing the manual gauge on there. Uh, it's nice to be able to do that. So if you're worried about electronics, go classic, man. Uh, okay, Kazender, what is the best first off-roader? Oh, what is the best first off-roader? A Wrangler TJ or a Cherokee XJ for a high school student? That's a tough question, and I think it might be a little controversial no matter what one I chose. I think if I chose a TJ, there'd be people out there who'd be arguing and vice versa. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pull it out here and I'm gonna say I think the Cherokee XJ is a great one for a student. The reason being is because they're cheaper. Uh, TJs are a little more expensive. Um, and you know, that's what we did for my sons when they were, um, when they first got their license, we had an XJ, the twins, they shared it. They helped me build it. Uh, it was inexpensive. Uh, building it up was cheap. Uh, I think the TJ is a better platform for off-roading. I know I just offended a ton of XJ guys out there, but look, it's, it's a frame, it's a body on frame. Um, so yes, you can stiffen an XJ and I know we can have a debate about this all the time, but this kid's asking me. I apologize, I'm calling you a kid. This high schooler is asking me which one I think is better. I think, you know, for somebody that's on a budget, an XJ is good. Uh, if you can afford it, go with a TJ. There you go. For Ranzer, uh, Brad, I'm a brother chief. I'm 
about three years out from retirement, going back, is there anything you wish you did to help with the transition out or something you are glad you did uh, that definitely helped? Well, first of all, thank you for your service. And man, I'm excited for your retirement. Three years, it'll go by really, really fast. Uh, I will say I was very thankful. You know, I did a lot of the normal transition planning and training that the military offered before I got out. But networking, networking, networking is huge. Uh, start networking now with people uh, in your industry or the industry that you want to get into. For me, I, I was blessed. Um, there was, so some of you may not know, but when I retired from the Navy, um, I immediately started a job with the Naval Health and Research Center. And I did that job for several years until I started doing YouTube full time. How I got that job, uh, I didn't apply for it, which was crazy because there was a time I was like, I was the same situation. I was really worried about like, what am I going to do when I retire? Well, the Naval Health and Research Center had actually done a research project at a command that I was working at several years before I retired. And they came out and they were doing some stuff and, and I was helping them. Uh, apparently I was very nice to them, uh, making sure everything was going smoothly. And so when they found out that I was getting ready to retire, they called me up and said, hey, we really appreciated everything, your professionalism, you know, you were kind, you were everything. It was great. And they just hired me on the spot. So, you know, that karma thing that really worked out for me uh, because I didn't even think that that was a job that I would be doing once I retired going working for a research center. Uh, but that just all worked out. So networking and man, just be good to people. There's something about that. That's a life lesson for you there, right there. Good luck on your retirement there, man. Okay. Uh, Ooh, I don't know how to say this. Tatero more? No, I'm not even going to try it. Forget it. Let's just ask this question. Uh, what are the reasons for changing from a beadlock wheel and to a normal one? Are you liking it? So good question. And I get asked often. So I did pull the beadlocks off of the Wrangler. It's been, I don't know, six, eight months now. It's been a little while. Uh, the reason I did that was one, they're heavy. Um, I loved those beadlocks. I mean, they just look good. Uh, they were durable. I banged the heck out of them, but they were heavy. And so going to these has saved me a ton of weight. I actually remember putting them on the scale and I don't remember what it was. I don't remember what it is now, but it was a significant difference in the weight. Plus when you are out on multiple day adventures, you know, when we were going to Baja and all those kind of places, if you get a flat, it's great. You got a full size spare in the Wrangler, swap it out. But now if you have to keep going for multiple more days, do you really want to go without a spare? I don't. And I would like to be able to go to a tire shop and have them, you know, replace that. Uh, most tire shops will not touch a beadlock. So then what are you going to do? You're going to have to do it yourself and then it may or may not be balanced. Hopefully you don't get another flat. Uh, now I sold my beadlocks and I do kind of regret doing that. Uh, I probably should have saved them because I think beadlocks are great when you're going to go hit it hard and having those and being able to air down low is really, really nice. So there may be some beadlocks down the road. I don't have plans to buy them right now, but maybe I'll get another set of beadlocks and just save those for when I'm going to go tackle the hard trails. But I think for just general use, gas mileage, the overlanding trips, a non beadlock is, is the way I'm going to go. So there you go. That's the reason for that. Uh, screaming lizard JKU is your ball joints. If your ball joints wear out, what brand would you go for, for replacement? Well, that's easy. Uh, my ball joints did wear out on the JK many years ago and I swapped them out for the Dynatrack ball joints. They're a little more expensive than the other ones, but you know what? Uh, they held up great. I had no problems. A significant difference too. When I upgraded my ball joints, if you're running larger tires on your vehicle, if you're lifted, uh, you need to just go ahead and upgrade your ball joints because it's just a matter of time before the stock ones will fail. Downtime crawler. What are, um, what are the top mods you have done to the gladiator? And so that, that's a good question. And uh, I think you'll be a little bit surprised on the answer. So first is the suspension. For me, the suspension was a huge, huge improvement uh, to the Gladiator because once I started putting bigger tires and all that weight, the rack and the tent and going off road, it was like a boat going down the trail. I mean, it was super soft. And so once we put the Icon Vehicle Dynamics lift kit on there, I had the ability to adjust everything, uh, the shocks out, man, it just rode so much better. I love the ride quality on the Gladiator. I can tow with it. I can weigh it down. No complaints. So that was number one. Uh, number two, 
is my dash uh, mount system. I love that thing because I've got my phone on there, I've got my iPad on there. It's a perfect layout system. We have the same system in my wife's jail. It's just, it's great. The 67 Designs mount system, it's the best. Uh, and then the third thing I would say is probably my fridge slider. Uh, the fridge slider was nice because, you know, initially we would go out, I was just throwing a cooler back there and then I was putting a fridge and trying to strap it down and it was just kind of cumbersome. And so putting that uh, fridge slider with the table on there, that's a Timbo Tusk fridge slider, I know somebody will ask, uh, it has made a world of difference. And I love that thing because it comes in and out easily. So I just take it out, there's two mounting plates, and then I have easy access to the truck bed, which is cool. So I love that. It's the, sometimes it's the small, simple things that work that really impress me. Uh, weekend off-road. What was your first experience memory hitting the dirt um, that got you into four-wheeling? So great question. So if you go back to our very first video on the channel, it's not the first time we went off road. That video is up a little higher, and that's a story for another day. Uh, it's the miles of mud, and so there's no there's no talking in that video. That was just music and filming because it was the beginning of our time. Um, there's a great story behind that. We went out, my son and I, Jordan, went out for a day trip. We had planned a trip. We're going to hit this trail. You know, we were all excited. And uh, we got out there and we're driving down this road and we see these two Jeeps parked on the side of the road. And you know, I just kind of like, you know what, I'm just gonna pull over and ask them where they're going. And so we did, I just pulled over and just started talking to these guys, a complete stranger, trail recon wasn't even a thing. And, uh, and I said, well, we're looking for this uh, Canyon Sanabre, we're gonna go look at the mud caves. They're like, yeah, we're going, come on with us. And I was like, what, come with you, that's awesome. So we did, so we went wheeling with those guys, we met up with some other people, and man, we had an awesome adventure. My son and I in the Jeep, and then we met these people, and by the end of the day, we had just this close relationship with everybody, and that was instant for me. I was like, this is it, I love this. I mean, we've been off-roading for a long time, in you know, four by, four, in, uh, quads and dirt bikes, uh, but this this was different uh, and it felt so awesome. And so it was just that experience really kind of kicked it off for us. Uh, and Ralphs, if money wasn't a factor, what would be your dream build for your Gladiator? Drivetrain, mod, suspension. Uh, I, I, well, I kind of already alluded, alluded to it. Uh, take that Outpost 2 camper and throw that on the black uh, on the back of my gladiator and then how about we throw some 60s underneath and some 40s on there that would be pretty cool yeah that would be and a hellcat motor can we put a hellcat motor in there money's no object you said that would be it that would be an awesome 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 off-road vehicle that's a dream um for low adventures what is your long-term goal with e3 overland and is it completely separate from E3 Off-Road? Well, thank you for that question. A lot of people have been asking about E3 Overland. First, let me say, I'm super excited about E3 Overland. Put a lot, a lot of work into that. Um, we were have, supposed to have launched already, but we've delayed that just because of the current world situation. We do plan on launching soon, uh, but we've been having a lot of fun with that. We actually just did a call this week, a live call where everybody that's already signed up, we were on the phone talking to people, just having a blast, it was awesome. Uh, and we've already sent out a couple emails where people that uh, have just signed up, they're not even members yet, are getting some cool discounts. Uh, we'll be launching soon, which will be awesome. I'm really excited for that. Uh, but the question is, what's my long-term plan? The long-term plan, is I just wanted to be able to do things with you guys outside of YouTube, whether like online calls, uh, like meetups, that kind of stuff. There's so much, so much outside of YouTube that we can do to build a community, to engage with one another. I'm really excited. Go check out the website, link down below. Uh, and the question, uh, is it different than E3 Off-Road? So there's E3 Association is, uh, is gonna have several branches right now. There's E3 Off-Road, there's E3 Firearms, there's uh, E3 Overland, there's gonna be an E3 Fishing, and there's more to come and so we're all under one network but I'm the co-owner of E3 Overland just to clarify that and the focus on Overland is self-sustained long distance travel and camping and you know planning your trips all that kind of stuff whereas off-road is you know building your rig and going out and finding trails and do, you know off-roading safely that kind of stuff so different similarities but different so there you go I hope that answered your question I'm super excited about it uh, and I would love to have you guys as a member of E3 Overland okay uh, LDs, I am best coffee. Ooh, that's tough. Uh, can I just take a sip? We've been sitting, we've been going for a minute. The kind of best coffee is just a good cup of black coffee. Uh, lately, I've been drinking uh, actually just black from uh, Black Rifle Coffee Company, uh, but I, I'm not a coffee snob. I like a good quality cup of coffee, but I don't know if I have one that's my favorite. I guess that's not the right answer because this is garage coffee. 
Maybe what I need to do is maybe like, well, maybe we need to kick this off by having a, you know, bag of coffee here that I'm drinking or whatever. But honestly, I'm not picky. I just like it black. No foo-foo coffee for me. Okay. Conquer life. What are the top three lessons learned from trail riding? Okay. Well, apparently I was talking to the camera for several minutes and the audio battery went dead because uh, I'm using a lavalier mic. So note to self, before we do this, I need to change the battery. So let me just jump back to the question right before the audio kicked out. So Conquering Life wants to know, what are the three top lessons you learned trail riding and overlanding? Great question. Always bring spare nuts and bolts with you. Uh, something I always carry in my tool bag, but make sure you replenish them when you use them. Uh, I'm constantly, you know, hey, does anybody have this size bolt? Or maybe there's something I need and pulling those and using them. I oftentimes forget to restock those bolts because you may need them again. That happened recently. Um, so always have nuts and bolts. Top off your fuel tank before you hit the dirt. Um, I've been thankful that I've practiced that most times uh, when, especially when we were in Coyote Flats, you may have seen that video a while back where we went all the way up, we came to that big obstacle and we had to go all the way out. That wasn't the plan on going all the way out and so well, the fuel got really low uh, that day. Uh, there's been a couple times, well I shouldn't say a couple times, there's one time in uh, uh, my son and I were out on the trail by ourselves. And we, we were just gonna go out for a short little thing, drive and we kept exploring, exploring, exploring and wasn't paying attention to the gas and we didn't fill up before we went on the trail. So lesson learned, that was a long time ago. We won't ever do that again because we almost ran out of gas. Uh, and then know what your tide tables are if you're gonna be camping on the beach. And I talked about that in an episode a while back, uh, but lesson learned to me, if we're gonna camp on the beach, I'm gonna know where high tide is gonna end up. Uh, Jim Mendez 1174, what type of cabinets are your in are in your garage? They look clean and slick. Well, thanks. I love these cabinets. I ordered a bunch of these. They're off Amazon. They're Ultra HD. I'll leave an affiliate link down below. You can go check those out. Uh, but they're great because they look clean. Plus, I like that they're pretty narrow. So they actually fit perfectly between the edge of my garage door and the wall. Um, and it just allows me to store all my stuff in there. I've got a lot of gear in there. I probably Now it's probably a great time to pull everything out and kind of go through it and clean it. But uh, they're a great cabinet. I, I've been getting a lot of questions about the cabinets. Uh, Christina Lopez, uh, when can we go camp with you? Well, uh, great question. Uh, I get at, Marco and I get asked that all the time. Hey, can we come out you know, on your, with you on your next adventure? And man, we would love to be able to take people with us. Um, the important thing for us is we want to get to know somebody first. We want to know that they, you know, they've got a capable vehicle, that they're you know, skilled in you know, doing some minor repairs, and they've got some good driving skills. Um, last thing we want to do is have to worry about babysitting somebody out there. That's not the right thing to say, but you know, we want to enjoy the adventure and we want to make sure that the person coming with us is, is ready to go. Uh, people have asked us before, hey, we'll pay you to come out there and we don't want to do that. I would never want to make this feel like a job where I'm responsible for somebody because we're paying with us. Uh, so look, if you're out at Overland Expo or you're coming to any of the overlanding events or Easter Jeep Safari uh, or E3 Overland events that we're going to be having around the, the country, uh, come out, let us get to know you. I think it'd be great. We always, you know, have new people come out with us that we've gotten to know. We have a blast with it, uh, but we want to get to know somebody first, just like you would want to get to know us first. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess you kind of know us on the videos, but it would suck for you if you went out and like, Marco and Brad, man, they're, they're kind of food snobs, or, you know, whatever, I don't know. Uh, but we just like to get to know people first. Okay, uh, last question, Brent Kiggin, uh, could you talk a little bit about your Jeep bad Badge of Honors. Yeah, that's a great question. I get asked about those all the time. So the Jeep Badge of Honors is a Jeep program, and, and there's an app that you put on your phone, uh, and you enter your VIN number, and then your information, and then when you go to a trail like the Rubicon Trail, and I think there's, I think there's a total of 40, 41 trails out there uh, that are Jeep Badge of Honor trails. When you pull up to one of those trails, you check in with the app using your GPS, you can go run the trail, and then a couple weeks later, they will send you that badge, and they're, they're pretty cool. They recently updated the badges. Um, they were colored before, now they're all a new type of badge. Uh, I, I don't know how many I have, but I got quite a few. I've had a blast getting them. I, I wish they were available to other types of vehicles uh, out there. I think there's some stickers that do kind of similar things, uh, but that's just a Jeep program, and all you gotta do is download the app. It's free, uh, it doesn't cost you anything. It's a pretty cool program. Uh, all right. 
I hope you guys have enjoyed uh, hanging out with me here today in the garage. Uh, look, if you are not following Trail Recon, I'm going to do a little shameless plug here on Instagram. Go follow me on Instagram. That way you can see what's going on behind the scenes and behind these videos. And I hope you guys are all doing well. I hope you're healthy. I hope you're safe. Uh, I cannot wait for things to open up so we can go hit the trails again and so I can start filming some adventure videos for you guys. I'm really looking forward to that. I hope you've enjoyed hanging out with me in the garage, drinking a little coffee today. We'll see you in the next video.